This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidui Ewart. It's Friday, June 28th. This is Africa 54. Tunisian President Beji Kaid Esebsi is recovering following Thursday's health scare and twin bombing attacks on police. The Tanzanian diaspora in the U.S. capital addresses issues directly affecting African women. And in our Music Makers segment, the vibrant beats of the Nigerian hit song Echo by Keys Daniel. The health of Tunisian President Beji Kaid Essebsi has improved significantly and on Friday morning he called the Defense Minister to discuss Thursday's turbulent day in the North African country, according to the office of the President. Essebsi, 92, was taken to a military hospital Thursday after becoming ill and suffering what officials say was a severe health crisis. Two suicide bombers blew themselves up in twin Thursday attacks on police in the capital Tunis killing one officer and wounding several others. Essebsi has been a prominent figure in Tunisia since the overthrow of veteran autocrat Zine El Abidin Ben Ali in 2011, which was followed by uprisings against authoritarian leaders across the Middle East, including in nearby Libya and Egypt. Tunisia set itself on a path to democracy without much of the violence seen elsewhere, although it has been the target of militant Islamists over the years. Now to the latest on the mining tragedy in the Democratic Republic of Congo. As the search for more victims continues Friday, the number of small-scale miners killed by a landslide at a copper and cobalt mine run by Glencore has risen to at least 43. Thursday's accident occurred at the KOV open pit mine at the Komodo Copper Company concession near Congo's southern border with Zambia. A union official representing the Komodo Copper Company employees says a crack in part of the pit had been noticed on Wednesday and that red warning signs had been put up, but the diggers ignored the signs. In East Africa, Ethiopian authorities on Friday arrested the spokesman of a political party which promotes the interests of the Amhara ethnic group, according to the party president. The detention of Christian Tadele comes one day after state media announced the arrests of 250 people in the wake of a failed coup attempt in Amhara region. Ethiopia has been on edge since twin attacks at the weekend in Addis Ababa, and Bahir Dar killed the army chief of staff, the region's president, and three other senior officials. The violence, which the government says was part of a plot by a rogue general and his militia, to take over Amhara exposed how ethnic tensions are threatening the reform agenda of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Abiy, Ethiopia's 42-year-old leader, has won international praise for opening up one of the continent's most closed nations, but analysts say the rapid changes have fueled uncertainty and insecurity. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court on Friday has agreed to hear a bid to reinstate $4.3 billion in punitive damages against Sudan in a lawsuit accusing it of complicity in the August 1998 Al-Qaeda bombings of U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania that killed 224 people. The justices took up an appeal by hundreds of people that were hurt and relatives of people killed in the bombings as they seek to reinstate the punitive damages that a lower court in 2017 ruled could not be levied against Sudan, in addition to about $6 billion in compensatory damages imposed in the litigation. The truck bombs that detonated outside the U.S. embassies in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam marked the first large-scale al-Qaeda attack beside lawsuits over the embassy bombings. A number of defendants have been convicted in U.S. courts in connection with the attacks. And it's time now to turn our attention to the Africa Cup of Nations. And joining us live from Cairo, Egypt, is Africa 54 sports guru,
Sunday, Shomari. Good evening, Sunday. And now the match between Tunisia and Mali has just ended a few minutes ago when I left the newsroom. It was 1-1. One, one. Is, who is the winner? Okay, Esther, good evening to you. Um, the match has ended in a one-all draw. It means that Tunisia and Mali, everyone has one point tonight, and that group means is still open, Esther. And right here, I'm standing in front of a Somali restaurant in Nasri City. People are here ready to watch the following games tonight, and they cannot wait to see those tassels coming up between African giants, Esther. It's a night that they're waiting for. Now, Sunday, yesterday you promised to follow up on Tanzania and Kenya. It was a do or die, but unfortunately, Tanzania lost to Kenya. What more? Are these brothers seeing eye to eye anymore? <laughs> it's going to be that it's going to be tough. I think you saw what people have been doing in social media right now. Eric Omoni is having a lot of fun in social media. But anyway, brothers from another mother, it's over now. Kenyans won, and last night. I met a lot of fans chanting and singing Kenya to Nakanyaga, meaning that they were the winners with this diamond song Kanyaga that just came out. So Kenyans are very happy. And I spoke to Tanzanian captain Mbwana Samata. He was really, really sad and said, you know what? We lost this game. And Kenyans were very happy, praising the supporters, saying that they did a lot to support them. Kenyan captain Victor Wanyama told me that, that supporters were there for them and supporters, Esther, are just like a number 12 in the stadium because you have 11 players. Supporters are the next to the line. They're really, really playing a very big role, if you like, Esther. Now, there'll be other neighborly brothers in a few um, hours from now. Namibia plays uh, South Africa. What are they promising? Esther, the coaches are very careful right now. As you know, South Africa is a giant in soccer. But Namibia, not so much. But anyway, South Africa has been warned by their coach not to be complacent because Namibia showed a run for their money in their very first game when they played in Morocco. They lost the last end. It was almost going to be a draw. So you know it's going to be a tough game. And South African coaches are saying that this time around, we have to make sure it happens because they lost, if you remember, their very first game. Mm -hmm. So now they need a win. And this time around, it's brothers as well, because these are neighbors. How it's going to happen is going to be a tussle of brothers from another mother. And who is <laughs> going to win, we don't even know. It's going to be 90 minutes, Esther. All right, Sandy, I'm going to let you go so you can watch uh, Morocco and Mali as they do their thing. Thank you so much, Sandy. Sandy Shomari is Africa 54 Esther. sports correspondent talking to us live from Cairo, Egypt. Now, the Tanzanian diaspora in the Washington, D.C. area recently held an event aimed at empowering and uplifting African women. The conference attendees discussed issues directly affecting African women, including immigration, entrepreneurship, and education. VOA's Radia Adam has more in this report. The African Union representative to the United States conveyed a clear message to African women in the diaspora. Gender representation is a priority for the institution. Erikana Chihimbori Kwal said that progress without the participation of women in decision making isn't feasible, and that the AU hopes to reach that goal in 2025. African Union is leading by example. Of the 10 commissioners uh, at the African Union, two of them are the chairperson and the deputy chairperson. The remaining eight, five are women. So African Union is saying, Women must lead. They are the majority of the Africans. They must be on the table. They must be on the negotiating table at every level. Women empowerment was a theme during a conference held in Maryland and attended by women from Tanzania and the wider diaspora. Discussions on immigration gardened more discussion in light of the United States President Donald Trump's administration's policies, including laws that criminalize undocumented immigrants. Some attendants with pending immigration statuses were able to broach the subject in depth with professionals in the business. Fatmata Berry, an immigration lawyer, says African women need to have a better understanding of their rights as it relates to the laws within the United States. She used children coming into the U.S. with their parents and finding themselves in immigration detention centers as an example to magnify the risks families take in search of a better life. 
including risks of deportation. They are being detained, they're being deported for various reasons. And part of the problem is that a lot of our young um, people don't realize the immigration status at all. So women are losing their children to the system. It's easier for an immigrant child to become embroiled in an immigration and legal problem. Way, way more easy than an American child. Joe Hanyangani, vice president of the Automatic Train Control, also known as ATC Metro, says women mentors and leaders in a cause to bring them together is a challenge. A cause touching all Tanzanian women, for instance. I spoke to many different women in our community and they all explained to me what their challenges are. So the purpose of today is mostly to meet one another, exchange ideas, educate one another and build relationships among the different sectors of issues that were spoken about today. This was ATC Metro's first women empowerment event and organizers say they plan to host more events in the future aimed at educating and empowering African women in the diaspora. Razia Adam for VOA News, Washington, D.C. U.S. President Donald Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin met in Osaka, Japan Friday on the sidelines of the G20 summit. Tensions and rhetoric between officials of the two powers has been rising. Yet in Russia, people viewed this latest encounter between these two leaders with some hope but also skepticism. From Moscow, Ricardo Marquina has this report narrated by Philip Alexiou. Last year, President Donald Trump and President Putin met in the Finnish capital, Helsinki, after three long months of preparation and with many important issues on the agenda. Since then, the strains between Washington and Moscow have not only not improved, but analysts say they have deteriorated even further. I doubt that the summit will lead to the signing of any document as well as reaching any agreement. But I hope that these summits will finally become quite pragmatic in character and will become such a regular occurrence or at least a basis for such normal diplomatic relations at the top level. We know how everything happens unexpectedly. It seems to me that the meeting will take place anyway, provided that Trump confirmed many times that he is more than willing to talk to Putin. Trump and Putin will take on thorny and divisive issues such as Venezuela and Ukraine. Both men have boasted a personal chemistry that has been obvious in past meetings, but the good personal relationship between them has yet to result in a breakthrough on these issues. When in 2016 Trump was coming into office, there were quite a number of comments that said the personal good relations of both presidents would positively affect the relations of both countries, yet we see that is not happening. And after 2016, there were much more critical situations than before 2016, and they even can be compared with quite tough crises dating back to the times of the Cold War. Let's remember the 50s. Eisenhower was the U.S. president, while Khrushchev was the head of the Soviet state and the Communist Party. Relations between the United States and the Soviet Union were horrific, while the relations between the presidents were very good. Among Muscovites, the encounter between the two leaders in Osaka triggers mixed emotions. Well, if someone else failed to reach an agreement during such a long period of time, it probably won't work now. We hope there will be a warming in the relations between our countries. Going into the summit, there were no big hopes, and many Russians expect few changes in the geopolitical reality. For Ricardo Marquina in Moscow, I'm Philip Alexio, VOA News. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, the hottest new music hit out of Nigeria. We'll be right back.
I am Sheikha Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. Could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic. It is the beat, the African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the Voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com/africanbeat. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. Global ride-hailing company Uber is in talks with regulators over plans to expand into Ivory Coast and Senegal and provide a boat service in Nigerian megacity Lagos. A number of motorcycle ride-hailing firms have also targeted West Africa as an area for expansion in the last few months. Ivory Coast and Senegal have two of the world's fastest growing economies, according to the International Monetary Fund, while Nigeria has Africa's largest economy. Uber faces stiff competition in African cities from Estonian ride-hailing firm Bolt, which until early 2019 was called Taxify. Next up, in the shadow of Sasol's coal to liquid plant in Secunda, South Africa, a scientist is searching for the elusive serval cat. Though difficult to spot, new data indicates a very high density of the animal in the 85 square kilometer secondary area around this industrial site. In South Africa, serval cats are considered as near threatened on the International Union of Conservation of Nature red data list of threatened species. A big factor in their threatened status is the trade in skins for religious purposes. The serval cats don't have any human or predator threats in the Sasol Secunda secondary zone. As wilderness areas diminish, industrial exclusion zones may become more recognized as wildlife havens for wildlife able to adapt. And finally, aside from cheerful tunes and delicious soft serve, ice cream vans also churn out harmful fumes. Some cities are even looking to ban them because of the environmental damage caused when engines are left running to keep freezers cold. But Nissan has come up with a zero emission alternative. The company has partnered with Scottish ice cream producer Mackey's, a family owned dairy farm powered by renewable wind and solar energy. The Nissan Energy Rome was launched on Clean Air Day in Britain on June 20th and goes on sale later in 2019. And that's what's trending today. Former U.S. Vice President Joe Biden was among 10 Democratic presidential contenders on stage Thursday night for part two of the Democratic Party's first presidential debate. The candidates were often critical of President Donald Trump, but did not hesitate to turn on each other. VOA national correspondent Jim Malone has the details. On the debate stage in Miami, Florida Thursday, 10 more Democratic presidential contenders took part in a televised debate hosted by NBC following the first 10 who debated on Wednesday. Former Vice President Joe Biden, the current frontrunner in the large Democratic field, left little doubt about why he is running for president. I'm going to lead this country because I think it's important we restore the soul of this nation. This president has ripped it out. It's the only president in our history who has equated racist and, 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 and white supremacist with ordinary and decent people. Biden stood next to Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, currently running second in the polls. Sanders argued that the country's problems are much deeper than merely defeating President Trump. Nothing will change unless we have the guts to take on Wall Street, the insurance industry, the pharmaceutical industry, 
the military-industrial complex and the fossil fuel industry. At times during the two-hour debate, Biden found himself on the defensive. California Senator Kamala Harris challenged Biden's defense of his past efforts to find common ground with segregationist senators and his past opposition to forced school busing to integrate schools. It was hurtful to hear you talk about the reputations of two United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. Biden responded with a spirited defense of his record on civil rights and his tenure as vice president under the first African-American president, Barack Obama. I ran because of civil rights. I continue to think we have to make fundamental changes in civil rights. And those civil rights, by the way, include not just only African-Americans, but the LGBT community. Biden and Sanders are both in their 70s. And the generational divide within the Democratic Party was on full display when California Representative Eric Swalwell challenged Biden directly. I was six years old when a presidential candidate came to the California Democratic Convention and said, it's time to pass the torch to a new generation of Americans. That candidate was then Senator Joe Biden. Joe Biden was right when he said it was time to pass the torch to a new generation of Americans 32 years ago. He's still right today. Another younger Democrat who has climbed in the polls in recent months from relative obscurity is the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Pete Buttigieg. Like many on stage, Buttigieg slammed the Trump administration's approach to immigration. But we should call out hypocrisy when we see it. And for a party that associates itself, with Christianity, to say that it is okay to suggest that God would smile on the division of families at the hands of federal agents, that God would condone putting children in cages, has lost all claim to ever use religious language again. Also taking part in Thursday's debate were Colorado Senator Michael Bennett, former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper, New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, author Marianne Williamson, and businessman Andrew Yang. Democrats will hold their next debates in late July. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. It's Music Makers Friday, and joining us now is Africa 54 Music uh, host, Heather Maxwell. And Heather, I'm excited to learn all about this songwriter and artist from Nigeria. Thank you, Esther. Hello, everyone, and happy Friday. So if you've never been to Lagos, Nigeria, Kiz Daniel has got you covered. The multiple award-winning Afrobeat singer released Echo on June 14th. It's a tribute to Lagos with Phil Keys on the beat. Join us now as Kwame Ofori and I present Echo from my music time in Africa radio.
If you know FitWise for Lagos, you know FitWise for anywhere. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So that was Kiz Daniel's brand new music video produced by Phil Keys, Echo. And that's Music Maker Friday. For more great Pan-African music, please tune in to Music Time in Africa, Saturdays and Sundays on FM and shortwave, or listen online anytime at voanews.com and just search for Music Time in Africa. And please follow me on YouTube, my YouTube channel, or Twitter at Music Time Africa. You can also follow me on Instagram, and that's at MTIA Maxwell, and Facebook at Music Time in Africa. Now, back to you, Esther. Heather, you're not going anywhere. I wanted a little <laughs> more of that music, but are we staying in West Africa next Friday, or what do you have uh, lined up for us? Uh, no, we are moving to Southern Africa, to Zimbabwe and Harare, to be specific. Okay, well, so... Uh -huh. I can tell you more about it if you want to hear it. Yeah, um, I'm very excited. In 2018, I was there... Um, exploring the uh, music landscape in Harare and I I met a musical couple that live in a neighborhood there and they have opened up their home to the kids in the neighborhood to teach them traditional instruments the mbira and dance and the uh, uh, marimba and so I'm gonna bring a report from from that visit to you all next week well I'm sure our viewers can't wait to see that, plus all the other places you're going to be visiting in the continent. Heather, thank you so much for another beautiful music today. Join Heather Maxwell again next Friday for more music makers right here on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend.